this was my way of trying to say goodbye because I couldn't before. As a, a little kid, he was my godfather, and being from a uh, French Catholic background in southern Louisiana, I, just, I looked up to him a lot, and then as I got older and we found out that we were both gay, we even got closer, and then to lose him as quickly as I did, I felt that there had to be something to work through that grief. My family and me are working on my quilt now um, so that I can have a hand in deciding what goes on the quilt. Um, and we're going to make it a family project to take time to do it. Tens of thousands have sought comfort in this personalized patchwork. Each section is the extension of a victim's life. Stephen Head, Andrew Finocchio, Steve Abrams. As a reminder of how many lives have been cut short by AIDS, consider this. The quilt is five times larger than it was when first exhibited in 1987. It weighs more than 8,000 pounds. Every day, another family braces itself upon hearing word that a loved one has been diagnosed with AIDS or a related illness, and plans are made for adding yet another panel to the quilt. Paul? Our topic tonight is the AIDS virus. Now, let me give you some numbers, okay? Total cases of AIDS in the U.S., 105,990. Total people died so far, 61,655. But, you know, it's not, a, it's not a topic of numbers. It's not an issue of numbers. It's an issue of people. For instance, Vito Russo quit his job to take care of his lover and was dying from the AIDS virus. Now, that was three years ago. And despite his efforts, the man he loved and tried to save died and is now remembered in the quilt. And now, sadly, the tragic twist to this story is that Vito has AIDS. He who tried to help now needs help. And that is Jim Harvey's job. Jim is the deputy director of the Whitman Walker Clinic here in, Wa in Washington. Whitman Walker helps AIDS patients who oftentimes have nowhere else to go. We thank you both for being here. I think we can't bring it any closer to home about what this, this disease does than to talk directly to you. Not only did you lose someone you loved from AIDS, but right. now you're fighting for your very life. Right. What, who is responsible? What? How do we, I guess the question has to be, how do, you know, we like to solve things. Let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's solve it. Let's take care of it. And this is something that we can't solve. Right. Well, it's a virus. I mean, how do you, how do you strangle a virus with your bare hands? You know, so when you say who's responsible, uh, I don't think we're asking who is responsible that the disease exists on the planet, but we're saying who's responsible that people continue to die at such a rate and there's no response, you know? And, and for that, I have to, I, I, you know, I have to blame uh, personally the government because the Whitman Walker Clinic and the Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York and the San Francisco AIDS Foundation are community-based services, and and they're the ones who took care, who did the things that the federal, state, and city agencies did not do. And now finally, they're getting a little bit more funding. Right. But the anger is very real and very appropriate. You know, we're, when 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 Jeffrey was suffering. Could you take him to any government agency? Was there any program? No way. No way. We went directly to GMHC, which was organized by the gay community, to provide social services for people with AIDS. And they helped him get Medicare, and they helped him, you know, the, as a client, they helped Jeff to survive a little bit longer. And these, these services were not in place. All of the information that New York City, which is where I live, yeah. learned about AIDS came to it in one way or another from the community. So a life was lost. And now you find yourself faced with the possibility of death from the same illness. Yes. Now there has to be government agencies in place. Now there has to be a place that you can turn to. Is that right. true? They're still dragging their feet on, for instance, testing experimental drugs. Jeffrey died six months before AZT became available. Now I know that drug was sitting on a shelf. You know, he could be alive now. I mean, feasibly. Or, I've had AIDS, certainly lived longer. I had AIDS four and a half years this month. And you're using you know, AZT? And I'm stable. Is it the drug that's helping? I'm sure it's helping. You know, I can't pin it on the drug because you don't uh, know it. It's very toxic, too. But the truth is that there are people living a long time now with this disease. Twelve percent of the people with AIDS in this country are fine at the moment. You know, and people don't realize that. Yeah. And yeah. We, need to, we need them to test these drugs more quickly and change the FDA rules. Jim Harvey and uh, his group, Whitman Walker, got right into this business real quick. <laughs> uh, they understood what was needed and uh, now is the major treatment center in Washington, D.C. That that's a safe statement. 
That's that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Tell me, your funding, your budget is like four point five million dollars, somewhere in that vicinity. Sixty percent of that is private donation. That's right. Actually, a little better than sixty percent of that's private donations. Um, and it's been that way for a long, long time now, and that's because of the fact that we're fortunate and we've got, and that we have a community that's very responsive. What happens if you don't get these private? How can you turn to the government? To the uh, I mean, here we're losing citizens, we're losing people, Americans. Can you turn and say, look, we need we need you to fund this program? And is that possible? Well, you know, the, the tragedy of it all of, of all this, Paul, is that that. Um, D.C. government, for example, there's an article that appeared in the papers uh, a couple of weeks ago. The D.C. government spends more on, on AIDS programs, uh, AIDS services, testing, you name it, than any place else in the country, and still, that's not enough. And the D.C. government's budget is, is, is strapped. You can't do much, you can't do much more than, than you know, is already being done. And at the same time, uh, we find that the federal government will continue spending millions and even billions of dollars on everything except why trying look, to help look, people let's, well, let's get let's get we're in washington I mean, why why i think it's because it's happening to disenfranchised groups of people who were not on every, anybody's agenda to begin with i mean I, I heard somebody say this on tv last week and pointed at an interviewer and said if this was happening to you and the white middle class heterosexual community there would be global panic and the government would respond this is happening to people nobody cares about. People who are identified as outside the mainstream of society anyway, and I think that's why it's taken them so long. They're not interested. You know, this morning, George Bush, when he got in his little helicopter and flew over the quilt, what would it have cost him to say, Barbara and I want to say that our hearts go out to those people across the street? You know, what does that cost? Does that cost uh, money? Did you get any reaction? Nothing. From the Zip. You know, and there's just an indifference that's killing people literally literally killing, killing people. people what do you need now uh, in order to, to, to do continue the work that you're obviously money but I mean how else can the community those who perhaps don't have money but say hey, look you know it could be my son or my daughter it could be me what what can I do what must I do well we, we find that that uh, we have lots of individuals and, and, and lots of groups that, that will come to the clinic, for example, and, and visit, and, and they run their own fact-finding missions, and we do that. Education is an extremely mm. important tool in all of this. Have we gotten past the point of no. thinking and believing no. that this is a disease that just no. strikes gays no. and just, you know, and... and, and no. uh, yeah. not, have we gotten not, past that yet? Not yet. <laughs> I, I see a little movement here in, in Washington, D.C., for example, you know, with a city where we've got a 73% uh, black population, the black community has been the slowest community to respond to this whole issue. But just in the last year alone, we've seen the emergence of at least four new organizations that have a mission, and the mission is to get into the black communities, carry the message, and carry vital services to people mm -hmm. here. So it's beginning to happen, but it's not happening fast enough, happening fast enough because we've still got too many people that are contracting this disease and dying from it, and a lot of it has to do with just ignorance. Let me just buttress what you're saying, because I think this is some stats you ought to hear about. In the D.C. metropolitan area, not just D.C., but in the metro area, the total cases of AIDS at 1,839. Total dead, 1,116. 56% black, 41% white, 3% Hispanic. It ought to tell you that, it, uh, that as you said, uh, those people that didn't think it was going to happen to them are now a part of these statistics. Exactly. You're right. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Unless it sits on your doorstep, this is not your problem. You know what I mean? Unless it's your 11-year-old son who dies from a... Exactly. From a, it's not your problem, but exactly. it is. Exactly. But it is. it is. That's the point. Well, these numbers certainly make a big difference because it, what's happening now is the numbers are so, so great and getting greater all the time that almost no one goes untouched you know if it's not a relative or a loved one it's a neighbor it's a member of your congregation mm -hmm. at church it's a member of a club it's somebody who used to sit on the bar stool next to you it's somebody you're touched Vito, jim thank you for taking time to come in and share the experience and and the effort sure thing uh with us let's hope that uh, somebody's heard something here that'll say hey wait a minute let me see what i can do because if enough people say that we can get on with yeah. taking care of this problem. Yeah. We thank you both. And we hope thank you live you. long enough to see that. Oh, I have no intention of going right. anywhere. All right. <laughs> All right. We thank you both for joining us again.
More than 60,000 people in this country. Again, I'll say that number, 60,000 people in this country have died of AIDS. Coming up, we'll go live to the mall and meet the man in person who came up with the idea of showing numbers in this most unique but humane way. Stay with us. By the way, this uh, graphic that tells you about this benefit tonight, that is tonight at the Kennedy Center, and it's one of the ways that you can help because they, they need those dollars that are going to come from the ticket sales. So if your time permits tonight, by all means, call and perhaps get down there and go see a play that's and we'll tell you a little bit more about it just at the end of the hour. This is in person, our topic, the AIDS quilt, now on display at the Ellipse. And when the idea for this quilt was formed, Cleve Jones established some very simple but important goals. He joins us now to tell us what those goals are are and were. Welcome to In Person, Cleve, and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Paul. Talk about the goals. What were you trying to accomplish? What did you want to do? The Names Project has three very simple goals. Uh, I wish they were simple. We're here to try and illustrate the enormity of the worldwide AIDS crisis by revealing the names and the faces and the lives that are behind the statistics. We're also trying to reach out to all the many different kinds of people whose lives have been invaded by this epidemic to offer them a positive and creative means of expression, to help break through the silence and the misinformation that continues to surround the disease. And thirdly, we want to provide the whole world with a very clear, powerful symbol of how decent, ordinary men and women respond to a health crisis. And we hope that we can touch people's hearts and help them to understand that these are people very much like themselves. I think from the beginning, this has been a disease that we always thought of as something that happened to other people. And with the quilt, we're trying to show that even if there are other people, there are people who are like you, very yeah, much like yeah, you. Yeah. You know, the other thing, too, Cleve, I think we ought to point out is that uh, this quilt represents not only the U.S., but several other countries. How many uh, other countries are involved? We've received panels now from 18 uh, other countries. We have chapters working in every English-speaking country in the world except South Africa. And we have a small group of people, black and white, together who are trying to get that started in South Africa. We've recently begun receiving panels from Brazil and also from Central Africa. Some of the ones from Africa now are made out of tree bark fabric using the traditional designs from Central Africa, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Zaire, Zambia. Uh, people, you know, in this country, we think of this as a gay American uh, problem. And one of the consequences of that uh, approach is that a great many people who are neither gay nor American have been doomed. Mm. Cleve, uh, what happens now? We've been told that because of the size of this quilt, it will not be uh, brought to Washington again and indeed will not be able to. What, what's going to happen next? What, 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 what's in the future here? Well, this is our third time in uh, the Capitol, and I have to confess that we're here this year with a, a fair amount of frustration in our hearts. I think the president's helicopter flight over the quilt was an example of e extraordinary indifference and callousness. I'm still pretty angry about that. But I think it just underscores the need for the quilt and the educational message. So what we intend to do in the coming months is to get even more aggressive about using the quilt as an educational vehicle, going beyond the gay and lesbian community now and trying to reach other high-risk populations such as the African-American community, and also to use it as an educational vehicle for those people who still don't understand the reality of this disease. Cleve, thank you so very much. Cleve Jones, thank you, Paul. Zandamal, thanks so much for spending time with us today. That's Cleve Jones at the Ellipse, and of course the quilt is down there for your review. We'll be back with a final word. Stay with us. Now we're